friends. Um, recording this intro the day before the premiere concert for the Avansari Vocal Ensemble. Uh, and this episode is with Brandon Ramos and Valerie Spates. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun sitting down talking with them. Uh, I work, work with those folks to help build the Avanzari website, which I will put in a link uh, here on the podcast. And uh, I don't know, it pretty much speaks for itself. There's, there's probably going to be a lot more um, coming about Avanzari in the next couple of weeks and months as we uh, head into the, the first concert of the, uh, of the ensemble and uh, going into the next couple of events. But uh, do check those out. I'm uh, very proud of the work we've done. Uh, if you check out the, the website, uh, avansariv.org, V's Vocal Ensemble, um, you can see the work that uh, Brandon, Valerie, and I kind of put into this and uh, think it's, think it's going to be really nice. If you are able to come out to the concert, it's going to be uh, tomorrow, April 28th. Uh, 2 p.m. is the start time at Wildwood United Methodist Church in Magnolia. And uh, we'd love to see you come out and, and see what we're up to. Um, and other than that, just uh, enjoy the episode. Thanks, y'all. Yeah. And then point in the opposite corner and be like, oh, yeah, that thing. And that was, oh, yeah, well, so you can avoid uh, offering the audience pizza, right? Pizza for me, pizza for you, pizza for me. <laughs> oh look, I have no money. <laughs> look. Okay. Okay, so this podcast thing, now that we have this intro out of the way. Do you have a like specific intro that you do for your podcast? So I do have an intro. What I what I will do is so we do this part and then I will go back and the intro comes in post. So okay. frame it properly. Um sometimes I do a sign on, sometimes I don't. Okay. Um <clears throat> uh, I'm going to do a sign-on, though, because sign-ons are cool. Okay. So, Can't relate to what podcasts are. I mean, I listen to, like, two or three, but, you know. I, you should listen to a Jocko podcast. Who's? Jocko Willink. Or Willick. I can always forget which one it is. That's a plug-in. Thanks. Yeah, that's going to be five bucks. Plugging in for oh, that. Yeah, okay. no. Curse you. <laughs> well, Jocko's Valerie. not paying me, unfortunately. That'd be cool, though. That's okay. We can... We'll bill it later. To, to yeah. get Venmo from Jocko. <laughs> I thought we were going to go with checks, you know, we would be proper and be official with this. Checks. Checks, checks. Anyway. I take checks, I'll take anything. <laughs> Retweet. So, uh, if you are listening to this, you probably know my name, probably the other people's names, uh, but you are listening to Music in Our World, um, hosted on johnpattymusic.net. Uh, I'm here tonight with Valerie Spates and Brandon Ramos. Uh, we've been working on a pretty cool project. Um, we've become pretty good friends over that, and we are just sitting here talking about music and and life and stuff. So, um, thanks for tuning in. And you know, I, I'm curious what's what's on y'all's minds. What's what's got you down? What's got you up? What are you thinking about? Well, I mean, making a mistake of driving to the airport a day early is one thing, but um, currently is like what the. Uh, We've got the Contemporary Music Festival at Sam Houston State, uh, singing really, really corny art songs. It's really, really entertaining. Uh, if you've heard of the Craigslist Leader, I did a variant of mine with a local nurse, I guess you would say. We'll say nurse, yeah, because probably a nurse. Yeah, mm. I'm hoping so. I mean, <laughs> anyway, anyhow, this, this character on Craigslist posts this thing, like he wants to meet this cute girl in urgent care. And, Wants to get her number and tries to, like, say these phrases that would be like, only she would know the answer to. Yeah, arranging music to that is really, really awkward. So, like, I therefore set all the music really, really awkwardly. And it, apparently people liked it. I don't really get that bit, so. Yeah, it's, uh, it resonates with itself. Really you should have been there. I mean, like, I think you would have really, really enjoyed it considering your sense of humor. I, I probably would have liked it. Was that, that was last night. That was last night, yeah. Yeah. But you had a rehearsal, so. Yeah. yeah. I mean... Was it just last night? Yeah. It's funny how days run together and also Wait, don't. Did mm-hmm. I have a rehearsal last night? I last night was Thursday night. Yeah, Thursday. Don't, doesn't Connor think me have a rehearsal? Not this week. I lied. I was planning for Thursday night to work on that website. Oh, yeah, that's right. Y'all really. That website looks great, by the way. Um, we're talking about the uh, 
uh, the choir project, uh, the Alvin Sorry Vocal Ensemble. Uh, uh, all three of us <laughs> happen to be board members, shameless and plug. And we are the website committee. Yeah. And so two, web two members of our website committee, John and I, basically spent lots and lots of time last night basically trying to get as much of it done as humanly possible. And it seems to be working so far. Our official launch date is soon. Are we, going, are we going later today? Are we doing Saturday? Mm -hmm. Are we doing Saturday? Oh, I wanted to release Saturday, but if we have to put it off one more week, I'm, off, I'm okay with doing that. Well, it's a it's, it's a rad project. Um, we we do have the website basically finished. Um, by the time this comes out, it may or may not be up already. If you want to check it out, um, Avansari ve dot org. You can also find the ensemble on Facebook. Um, and also, I mean, I think it's it's important to to kind of give dates. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably know. Like, I'm a I'm an avid singer and, and chorister, as is. Um, Brandon and we've all been working really hard on this project. Um, me, Brandon, and Valerie uh, for sure, and then uh, a couple other board members, um, and a lot of uh, like Houston-based uh, slash Conroe-based uh, music professionals and um, you know, people on the board that you know have real day jobs that are not in music, so they're not like starving artists. But um, yeah, the I mean. I think it would be good to kind of start with that and see. So, since Brandon, it was kind of your vision from the get-go. I think it'd be cool if you could kind of share what it, what you thought it was going to be when it started, what you wanted, and then um, maybe follow up with like what where you think we're at. Yeah, sure. Um, so, whenever I, I guess most of this started from my my uh, compositions. Uh, I'm a composition major at Sam Houston State, and I've really been really fascinated with the choral idiom. Um, especially sacred music, but it started with um, a piece that I arranged, or a piece that I composed um, in, the f in the spring of 2018. Um, I made an ensemble and I gathered all the people to sing for the uh, uh, Woodlands uh, Chamber Music Project, which is headed by the uh, leader of this podcast. <laughs> um, and then uh, the fall semester came by um, and, you know, I got inspired to write another uh, piece of music this time it was a sacred uh, setting of music and, and I found I created another ensemble um, out of students that were at my university and um, I don't know I was talking to John at some point and he was like you know for all the stuff that you do it seems like you're able to like bring people together you know for a common goal especially when it comes to music I was like oh and, and, and it took me a little bit to like kind of I, I had to mull on it for a little bit because you know you know Every musician deals with some uh, number of, or some level of imposter syndrome. Um, and so I was talking with my roommate and talking with one of my good friends, uh, uh, Victor Benny Wen. He goes by Benny. Um, Benny. And I was like, well, you know, I kind of want to make a choir. I mean, there's no one in Conroe that's within 30 miles of doing it. Why not, you know... If I get all the right people, why wouldn't I try to, you know, do something? And so, you know, I looked around in my research and I asked around, you know, is there any groups around here that do blah, blah, blah? And, you know, for the most part, I, you know, you'd have to go to Tomball or you'd have to go to Houston. And let's be honest, like, even on a Sunday, you're going to be stuck in an hour and a half of traffic just trying to get to Houston. Yeah. And so, you know, with that in mind, it's like, okay, well, let's see what else is in my favor. Well, there's, there, there's a local university 30 miles north of uh, Conroe. And that's Sam Houston State University, which has a very storied tradition of bringing out or sending out their really qualified uh, music educators, especially in the in the choral and vocal uh, idiom. So I was thinking, well, okay, well, th maybe there's something to it. And so you know, I, I literally contacted everyone on my Facebook friends list, or I <laughs> called everyone on my con on my phone contact list, and I was like, hey, do you know anyone who'd be interested in joining this? choir and you know and it really kind of just kicked off from there I hold on, I did forget about this one thing um, so I got together with my roommate who's the director of a student ensemble at Sam and then I and then my friend Benny and we talked about like all the potential expenses we could possibly go through in a you know in a, in a concert cycle you know what would it cost to put up one concert you know like the music rights the um, the reception things of the sort you know, we came up with like a decent number, all these 
things. We didn't come up with numbers, we came up with all the items. And then, um, for some reason, I decided I wasn't going to go to go home for Thanksgiving. Uh, my, I typically do it at my grandmother's house in San Antonio, but she passed away uh, three years ago, rest in peace. She was an amazing woman, but I, it threw off my vibe, and so I just, I just didn't want to go home for Thanksgiving because, you know, that was just a family tradition of mine. Um, and I told one of the, the uh, parishioners at the church that I'm a, a staff singer at, at St. James the Apostle Episcopal, Episcopal Church, and she's like, well, I've actually been looking to, like, invite, you know, someone who doesn't have anywhere to go for Thanksgiving. And so um, uh, Allison Zabik, who is another member of this board, um, she's like, you should come over for Thanksgiving. You can tell me about your pitch and tell me about your story, about everything you want to do. And so, you know, I, I helped cook some, uh, I believe I made a salad. And I think I helped a little bit with the stuffing. But, you know, uh, they graciously had me over for Thanksgiving. And, you know, uh, we talked about music, about why I wanted to do it, why, uh, you know, why people could possibly be interested in this, or who would be interested in this. And so, you know, with all that in mind, you know, it's like, okay, well, you know, I've got, like, my first two board members. I have Allison and I have Ben. And so, like, okay, well, you know, there's this person I know who happens to run this podcast as well. <clears throat> and I was like, yeah, he's, well, he's got nonprofit arts experience. So. Brian, <laughs> Brandon is trying so hard to not dra- name drop right now. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I feel like that's pretty meta, though. I mean, if you're on the podcast I mean it's fine <laughs> Hell, um, God forbid we name drop named um, my own name I didn't have anything to I promise I didn't I did a little bit it's fine no but uh, anyway like you know with my experience um, with the uh, Woodlands uh, chamber music project it was very easy to be like this person knows what he's doing and trying to like uh, be a pioneer in trying to promote the arts in a way that people typically don't it just makes sense to find another person who's like got that skill set or has that ability to know what generally needs to happen for something like this. And so, you know, like the, the next logical person to go to was John Patty. Um, and so, you know, I, all these meetings later, I'm like, I'm trying to figure out who, who I'm going to get for another board I, member. I don't have a phone number for Elise Wadman. <laughs> Siri, I need you to stop. I'm doing a podcast. <laughs> I mean, anyhow, Thank like, you, you know, get, you get interrupted, you know. <laughs> Siri just, like, butts rolling and everything. <laughs> but anyhow, like, I'm looking for this other, this, this fifth, ma- this magical fifth board member, and I'm, like, racking through all my minds. I asked one of my uh, friends who's pursuing a uh, master's degree in, in dance at Sam Houston, but he's also a music major, but plans, he plans on uh, doing a bunch of stuff with uh, creating his own studio for dance and for music and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but he was a little bit too busy in masters and uh, in dance. He was very rigorous at St. Mason. They have a very fantastic dance program. Um, and I was like racking my brain. Who who would possibly be interested in helping me with this project? And you know, who would be able to bring a lot to the table? And then I, I don't know, offhandedly, I think I had like a random conversation with you, and then like I was like. I sent you a really stupid pun on Snapchat. Yeah. And then I realized at that moment that Valerie Spates was like this perfect person for this job because like, well, she's an altruistic human being and generally cares about like making good musical products. And, you know, with that in mind, I was like, well, I knew she had made all these like PR type things for the the St. Houston State Orchestra. If you were to go, if you walk into this school of music and you go to the... um, office of the orchestral director, you'll see on the door that there's these really incredibly vividly beautiful uh, posters of like what the orchestra is performing and has like dates and everything and like without a doubt like they were like the most beautiful and like exquisite thing in the school of music you know everything else is like a poster with like some basic stuff and, and you know you have like your various like Greek groups that have whatever but like you could tell that this particular product was like super detailed and had all these uh, and all this information and there was pictures and it was edited clearly and properly and there was such an attention to detail and it was like I think I would want a person like that on this board because you know as someone who's dedicated who's willing to put in the work who's passionate about music it, it's it made sense that I would ask Valerie to be on this board um, and so you know then I had our then we had the five the five board members myself included um, I you know the limited experience I have with like running anything in terms of business, you know, it was like, huh, 
A music fraternity. Five Me Alpha Sinfo, which I do love and appreciate, and they're 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 a fantastic organization, and they're like the root for my my will to do this project. Um, fast forward a bit, you know, we're planning all these things out. We're planning out when we wanted to start rehearsals, how we wanted to get our name out, how we wanted to approach long term strategy, and you know, I guess we kept on meeting at pie places because I'm obsessed with pie. <laughs> That's my bad, you know. I'm broke, but I love pie. Pie is so pie great. Pie is real good. Um, <clears throat> no, uh, the ideas that everyone's able to bring to the table, um, even if sometimes they get shot down, you know, like every possible idea is like useful in, in some way, shape, or form. Um, and the wealth of experience that everyone has, we have someone who, uh, Allison is a uh, low-level executive at Exxon Mobil. John Patty's got John. Uh, Experience. Oh my god. Uh, John Patty has got. I do though. I really do. I've been working hard on it. What did you say? John experience. <laughs> um, and John's got non profit experience and he's no got uh, he's got experience running these uh, really, really small and intimate um, music settings. And then Valerie's got th this wonderful skill set on violin and understands what it really takes to like, be an accomplished musician and has clinic connections uh, with local arts groups in the area. In addition to a, to a really great skill set in, um, in, in like artistic design or like uh, promotion and things of the sort, um, uh, my friend, my well, my fir the first board member I would say, uh, Benny, um, he's got experience in in like getting the nonprofit status started. So like I knew that I had all the pieces in place to get this project started, and you know. After that, it was just a matter of like calling the people and saying, "Hey, we've got we've got the foundation for you know making sure that this can stay alive past one concert, you know." And then it was just asking people, asking people, you know, "Hey, we understand that you don't want to drive to Houston. Hey, we understand that you miss singing. We understand that you that's the thing that's missing in your heart because you know, you know teaching kids every day is like great." And everyone, everyone's response to like, how are you doing was the same. It's like, I love teaching. I love mm -hmm. my kids. I wouldn't trade anything in the world for them. But I, there's something missing in my heart that's really, really gratifying. And it's always choral music, singing with other people. And really, at the end of the day, like, that's, that's why this ensemble exists. It's, it's to help bring people that don't have this opportunity to sing the music that's just gratifying, not just like technically, but emotionally. Um, it gives them something to latch onto that they can relate to, that they can share with not just uh, the community, but with the other musicians as well. Um, we often talk about you know, STEM research and stuff like that, and you know, the benefits of you know, math and science and whatnot, but you know, uh, I can't remember who exactly said the quote, but like, you know, it, it loosely said it was like something to the effect of like, if we aren't f fighting for art, you know, what are we fighting for? Do you remember who? That is a Winston Churchill It was Winston quote, Churchill. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because there was something, there, it was something about um, the nation's budget during World War II. And they wanted to cut the arts budget. Right, That's right. The yeah, arts yeah. budget. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, I remember this. And then, um, and then he was just saying, like, if we're like, if we're gonna cut the arts budget, then there's really the no point in doing for? any of this. Yeah, what yeah, are we yeah. For? That's what it was. And so, you know, with that in mind, like, this is why the ensemble exists. You know, it's not perfect. You know, we have, you know, life happens, and everyone goes through like circumstances that are uh, atypical. But you know, we're an ensemble formed of people that want to be there. And there's not a single person that would be in this ensemble unless they seriously wanted to do it. And that's more or less the story of how, how and why this ensemble exists. That's cool. I, I think I think it's good to to kind of talk through it because there's times when this kind of thing gets really hard. I mean, as a as a composer, I've I've kind of I've kind of been there. You know, working with working with people. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things that can go wrong, but. Um, I also try to take notes. So, like, if I'm writing a piece, I'll try to also, like, keep a diary while I'm working on it and say, you know, um, I made this change and I talked with this person and they gave me this feedback. And then when it gets really hard, I'm like, man, this this sucks. I don't want to do this anymore. I'll go back and read. like, oh, well, you know, this is, this is why that happened. And now I'm in such a better place for it. Um, so I think it's really cool that we're kind of getting to talk a little bit about it. 
Um, but I think, uh, you know, it's, it was a cool vision. Like when I, when Brandon first told me about it, I was definitely like, I was right on board. I, I love singing. Um, you know, I make, uh, I contribute a lot, I think to the percussion world, um, you know, drums, they kind of, they kind of make me money, um, as, as much as they can. I love, I love playing drums, but, um, I have actually pretty much at this point equal experiences as, as a singer. And like, I'm in golly right now I'm currently in three different choirs um and all voluntary I'm, I'm finishing up school um but there's there really is something to it um but I think uh I think it would be cool to hear a little bit more from from Valerie and you know I just because we have to put you on the spot because, <laughs> because I've been bad. too quiet yeah it's, it's a it's a podcast no I mean I but I think it's cool you know the the cool thing about all of us being here is we we actually talk to each other about you know, how appreciative we are of what we contribute. Um, but it's also kind of cool if there's someone listening to this to, you know, p- part of the reason why we, I think it's cool to document this thing and to have this podcast and to make this public and free is because someone may have a great idea and be like, I have no idea how to get started. I don't know who to get to help me. You know, this person may have this skill set, but I don't know, like, what can they really do? Um, I, and I think it's, it's awesome to have the perspective of, I mean, you don't you probably don't have to look as hard as you think you do to find people willing and able to to meaningfully contribute to a project like this or something similar um if not music or even if not artistic like something that you want to do there's probably somebody out there who who is willing to help you so i think i think it's cool that we hear come from kind of kind of from everyone yeah um one thing that has really stood out to me um as a board member i'm the only person on the board with basically zero uh, choir experience in general. I'm not That's playing. That's true. Yeah, Rand and Benny, I have talked about this a few times. Yeah, even actually. Benny's sung in Find Me Often. That does count for something. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I have not sung in a choir since I was in third grade. So that does not count. <laughs> I'll give you that. I'll give you that. <laughs> that does not count at all. Um, and so it was really interesting for me as a board member to kind of go through and sort of parse through, okay, I, I'm a violinist and I'm a conductor and I'm a graphic designer and I do a lot with personal branding and I have a lot of experience with orchestral management. Okay, what can I bring to the table? And then when I'm sitting in a meeting, what do I have to let go of that isn't actually going to be helpful? And then once I let go of those things, it, was, it became suddenly so much easier for me to focus on where I can help and where I can be effective. And so part of that was we had to work on sort of streamlining our communication a little bit just so that I had a little bit more of a grid as to, um, like, for example, like, whenever we were needing tenor, that I didn't know, like, how, how bad of a situation is this? Like, how desperate are we? And, you know, I was freaking out a little bit. So for me, I think that um, it just became really important to get a few points of reference just so that I had a grid so that I could track along with everybody else in that sense. Um, if the situation were reversed and we were instead of a choir talking about an orchestra, and then I brought someone on my board member who had never played an instrument, then, um, then I would definitely need to take a little bit of extra time to sort of explain things about like, oh, why we need to have um, this kind of arrangement for the percussion, why we need to have a certain type of music stand or whatever, like things that are specific to an orchestra. I would need to take a little bit of extra time to just give some context to that other person. So that was one thing going into being a board member that I didn't expect, but I feel like I'm learning so, so much about collaborative work and... um, and how to get into a workflow? That's what we were talking about mm-hmm. last night. Because the we first couple times, <laughs> the first few times that we tried to generally discuss a website, it was like we kept like starting and stopping and mm-hmm. starting and stopping and starting and stopping. But then we finally got into a groove, and it just like it got done. Yeah, I mean, I'd, the cool thing about this too is, and and I, what, the one of the reasons why I think it's so cool that what we what we're doing in music and the arts applies to really everything is you have to have a couple of meetings under your belt. You have to kind of get the awkwardness of like not knowing each other very well out of the way so that you have context to in, in which to create what I've been referring to as a workflow. I mean, for, for example, we're, Valerie and I are working uh, diligently on the website so that it looks good. We've built our own websites 
Um, and so, you know, if we want to change something on our website, it's pretty easy. We just click and drag the thing and hit save. Whether it's good or not, we think about probably for a little bit and then we're like, oh, I'm going to do something else now. Um, but when we're working together on something and we know um, specifically in this particular project, I mean, golly, there's five board members and maybe up to 16 singers. We're looking at 20 people's reputations we have in our hands. And so we have to be a little bit more yeah, careful. No we do. Yeah. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, we, we, we know we have this, this sort of classy, cohesive idea in mind. And as we, as we work together more, uh, and as we get feedback from Brandon and some of the other board members, we, you know, we realize, yeah, we've got this, we've got the right idea. Um, now we just need to figure out how to practically make it work. Um, you know, we can pretty much make significant changes to the website with very little hassle at this point. Um, and some of that is, you know, the, the ease of, of technology and what that's doing for us. But I think it speaks a little bit more to also the, like the, the sort of team aspect of it. Um, and even though a two person committee is, is rather small, I guess, as far as a committee is concerned, <laughs> um, it's, it's good because two people can also be as, as opposed as can be, and there can be just as much in the way. Um, but I think, I think that's really cool. And we come from very different backgrounds. Um, so, I mean, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're thinking about tackling a project and don't, don't ever count anybody out, um, unless they, I don't know, unless they hit you with a stick or something, but, um, I don't know. Brandon's looking like Brandon's for a stick. Kind of, ah! <laughs> I'm a percussionist. I have, I have instruments hanging oh, over my stick. house. So. An actual stick. Hold on, I got it. <laughs> there it is. And Done. Brandon's hit me with a stick and no, we're going to vote him off, uh, next time. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, now, now looking for a uh, new artistic director, <laughs> Dr. Provenzari, uh Vocal Ensemble. Current, uh, what is this right now? <laughs> yeah. But one thing that I'll add is that um, a lot of the work that I have done uh, recently has been, like, mostly solo stuff. I, I generally, in many parts of my life, tend to be a little bit of a lone ranger. But it is... Um, I do get kind of frustrated whenever I'm working on my own website and I'm like trying to decide between, I don't know, two templates or two color palettes or two photos or whatever. And I'm just sitting there and I just like, I hit this wall just because I can't make up my mind. So it was so refreshing to just like have two options and then just able to say like, Hey, which one do you think? And then mm -hmm. you just give me an answer and then we move on. And then you just mm -hmm. make progress that way just by having even one other person give you a little bit of feedback. And so that was nice. You know, it does. It does kind of help, sort of, uh, I don't know, clear the pipes, as it were. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm very much a I'm very much an ensemble kind of work together person, um, which is one of the one of the reasons why the um, you know the ensemble idea is always better for me. Like whenever if I have a choice if I, about what I'm writing or what I'm working on, it's gonna be an ensemble. Um, solo things have just have never been my bag. I know I do kind of as much as I'm obligated to do. Um, but I, you know, for example, I'd much rather be in a choir than, you know, singing a solo or whatever, but, um, I mean, I, I think it's cool. I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, I, I, I want, first of all, I want everybody listening in, to hear this and to check out the ensemble. Um, you, you may even know somebody in it. I mean, we've, we've been kind of sort of setting up to, to begin marketing, but as of, you know, the 13th, um, we haven't we haven't yet gotten too much because there's a Facebook event, so definitely check that out. But when the website launches, I think we're going to be a little bit more active. Um, but you, like I said, you probably know somebody, or at least you know two or three degrees of separation, who's standing going to be standing on the risers um, at Wildwood on the 28th of this month. So um, I, I I think it's important to say that like obviously we're taking time to talk about it. it it's it's very important. Um, but I'm. I'm curious too, like what, what's the next step? Let's say that, you know, for y'all, what's, what's the next step? Let's say this first, um, program is a, is a huge success. What's, what do we do next? Or do you even know? I mean, that's another thing too, to think about, like, do we know what we want? I mean, obviously we want good music and we want good singers and we want a good program, but what, what's, what's the next step after we sort of achieve that for the first time? You want me to take this, or do you want to start? Or? Um, all I was going to talk about is like, well, I'll go ahead and start then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Yeah, no, I'm good with that. We should do a podcast on how to do a podcast. <laughs> I could use that because this is my first. 
Uh, anyway, I um, looked up big splotch there. It's like our big huge fall <laughs> that we just had. We're currently analyzing the uh, waveform. <laughs> there is indeed a, a big splotch. I so. assume that's not what you're supposed to say in a podcast. You can say whatever you want. Talk about podcasts and podcasts. I want to make another podcast talking about this podcast. It's really meta. Podcast and podcast accessories. No, no this isn't. Oh, this is Texas. <laughs> this is definitely Texas. What do you what do you, what do you think? What do you think about it? Um, so I was just going to say that one of the main things that um, was really kind of slowing us down whenever we were getting started was where are we going to do this and finding a location. And eventually we settled on we want. Some, it was something like 50 or 80% of our performances, we want them to be in the Woodlands Conroe area. Uh-huh. It was something, I don't remember exactly what it was. Do you remember? It was, that was around it the right was something, number. It was something, it was, isn't that the vast 50. majority, yeah, yeah for we sure. we want the majority of our performances to be in that area. So, I think the next step would be just building relationships with some of the venues that we've been looking at. Um, and some of those, like, you know, they're going to be a little bit later down the road, but just trying to find things that are within our budget right now that are within our, you know, within our reach, basically. <laughs> um, and that will help us to develop a better relationship with the community who doesn't know us yet. And, like, even though each one of us as individuals, like, we're, we live in this area and we know this area, the ensemble as a whole is a stranger. It's the mm. new person in town. And uh, so I think that the next step is building genuine relationships with the small businesses in the area and just finding places where we can, where we can do this. Yeah, so. I definitely agree with that. I mean, uh, it, it's been my goal to like have concerts and, uh, and, and other types of performances in the Conroe area. It doesn't have to be like necessarily the nicest venue because you know, you know there are people that can't necessarily have access to our music, say and people living in retirement homes and stuff of the sort. Um, I was recently just at um, the local Huntsville um, retirement home and I was, you know, I was talking about how I wanted to like do like recital series. You know, on my own, I'll just sing some like solo music that I had sung before, you know, in my gr- undergraduate years. And uh, I think doing something like that for a community that doesn't have access to it is like something that we should be doing, uh, you know. It's great that people can come to our concerts, but it would be really, really nice that we can be able to do something for people that have not, that don't have the ability to do something like that. Um, just those are oftentimes those people, you know, they need it. You know, we, we need to be able to share music uh, with not just the able. Um, and and th- that's really, really a, a, a big part of, I guess, what I would say our, is our choir is philan- philanthropy in a way. Uh, sharing music with people who don't necessarily know that they need it. Um, the, there's not many choirs in our locale that that do that. We, they don't sing like this really, really, really intimate or really, really high level music with such a small number of people. Um, it presents a real opportunity to get to, you know, not just be a number in a really, really large choir, but like, you know, with a small ensemble, you can be mobile and you can go to different places and be flexible with your schedules and walk into a place and be like, hey, well, we're this ensemble, we'd love to share this with you. And, you know, with, with such, with a community like Connor and Woodlands and Willis, all these uh, communities in the area, they're all very, they've got this small town vibe, even though they're relatively large towns. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And you can almost say that, you know, if you know one person, you almost you almost know everyone. And, you know, uh, trying to build on top of that is, like, really, really important. Um, with, with that said, um, in terms of, like, an artistic vision, um, I've, you know, I've tinkered with a lot of different things, you know. I, I, I you know, as, as a guy, you know, I, I'm, I'm always looking for, like, different things. And at the same point, I'm, like, I'm a guy. And how there have been plenty of female composers that have existed throughout time and space. Uh, why don't we do a concert featuring them, mm-hmm. uh, folks like uh, uh, Fanny uh, Mendelssohn mm-hmm. Hensel, uh, who was the brother, uh, sorry, brother <laughs> sister to uh, uh, Felix Mendelssohn. Uh, but you know, why am I saying it like that? Well, no, uh, Fanny Hensel was her own composer. She wrote mm-hmm. her own serious works that were independent of her own brother. 
um, you know, her brother shouldn't make her who she is. Why don't we feature, you know, composers of uh, living women composers that have contributed greatly to the American uh, choral scene or the American scene in general? Um, trying to go outside of what are normal, typical choir experiences. What if we were to do a collaboration with uh, dancers in the area? What if we were to do something where we, a particular project that I've been actually interested in, um, regarding the Carriage Inn, uh, the local retirement home, I walked in, I was like, hey, I want to do this recital series, and, and the uh, operations manager was like, hey, well, you know, we had this wonderful poetry contra- contest, and this all happened at the same time while I've been, you know, prepping for the um, American Voices uh, Arts Song Project, which is a uh, project which is sponsored by uh, Tony, uh, Dr. T- Tony Boutte at Sam Houston State. Um, pretty much the compo- uh, they encourage uh, young composers to create uh, art songs. Um, they- because you know, it, most people, you know, will, when they do compositions, it's usually something outside of like art on the Zoom. That type of thing is a little bit, I guess we'd almost say, just limited to instrumentalists in a way. It, that's how composition generally feels like to me. But with this, with with this art song project, it, it, I I looked at it. It's like, wow, this is an opportunity. Like with all these people's poetry, you know, we could. We could give back to them. You know, they wrote this poetry. You know, for for, for you know for poetry contest for for the retirement home. What if we were to set it to music? What if we were to set it to not just like art time, but say like a choral art form, and then give it back, mm-hmm. and then say, well, these are the people that make up the community. These are the people that make the music as well. In addition, and not just the singers. It it, it becomes a collaborative process with the entire community. Um, that type of thing is the type of community engagement that we want because, you know, choral music isn't, or even vocal music in general, or even, say, you know, classical music art form, it, 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 nece- it shouldn't necessarily just be limited to the, the elite, the people that have trained, you know, for decades upon decades. It should, we should share it, for, share it with everyone and make it relatable to everyone. Um, and, you know, for me, that is like an important goal that we be able to evolve to that point where we can do that and make it a standard alongside of like the standard choral repertoire. So, yeah. I think, I think it's good to have that sort of goal in mind. I mean, we talk a little bit about like idealism and I think it's good to have those, those high, higher ideals. It's not just, oh, I want something to sound pretty. It's, it's not even just, oh, I want to give back. It's I want to give back to specifically in these ways, these specific people in this specific area. Um, and I think that's super cool. I think it's really good to always kind of keep that in mind, too. Because um, I think um, it, it, can seem, it can seem really daunting when you, when you think about something like this, even if it's not a large-scale project like, like we're kind of involved in now, even if it's just something like, Oh, I'm gonna get a new job. I'm gonna I'm gonna write a new piece, or I'm gonna learn a new piece, um, or I'm gonna like I don't talk to this person or do something different, change something in your life. It can seem really daunting, but if you just kind of think about what you what you want to do and why you want to do it, I think that's that's really kind of cool. Um, but I'm I'm kind of curious now because as as we've gotten to know each other, like you know, we started off kind of talking about just the ensemble but what else is going on you know i know you know i've got a couple other irons in the fire but um I'm curious like what are you what are you working on what's what else is there i mean it can it can still be musical because i know we're musical people it's kind of hard to remove that part but i mean if y'all have anything else going on um i think that's that's a kind of a good good place to to think about Definitely think you'd be the person to talk about this, considering you, you're more invested in the non correlated oh. for the most part. Yeah. So. so one thing that I've been thinking about lately, I've been um, I've been working on opening a studio in the Conroe Woodlands area for some time now, and at the moment I'm still wanting to make sure that I've got all the groundwork laid out in terms of paperwork, location, um, making sure that my website is optimized for the kinds of things that I want to do. Um, the studio is going to be 
it's gonna have three main parts. One part will be standard ind individual violin lessons. The second part will be um, basically an opportunity for um, for students to get a really solid foundation in music theory and being able to read music. Um, at least enough so that they can go and find their own questions and not find their own questions and find their own answers sure. to yeah. questions, but yeah, also find their own find questions. Their own questions. <laughs> That's important. Right? And like, just give them enough information to be really curious and help them have the tools that they need to eventually become fully independent musicians. And then the third part of it is chamber music coaching. Um, and so that's, you know, a very simplified view of, um, of what I want the studio to eventually be. So at the moment, I don't have a lot of students and it was very interesting because I had been teaching private lessons for a very long time. And one of the reasons that I had actually stopped teaching private lessons, one reason was because I wanted to focus more on my classes and my undergrad. Um, and I had other things that I wanted to pay attention to, but one major reason was the more I learned about violin playing and the more I learned about pedagogy, the more I felt, I guess this would be three or four years ago now, that like I was not yet qualified to be guiding a young person, especially a child, into this. That I felt like I needed to learn more and I need to have more experience. And now I have learned more, I do have more experience. And then as I'm getting back into it, I'm teaching better now than I did before, and I'm, I fully intend to become an even better teacher and to always improve like as a pedagogue, but I kind of find myself, um, like I'm, I'm becoming very aware of like my own shortcomings just as a musician in terms of performance, performance anxiety, um, organizing my practice time and things like that. And I real and I very much catch myself like, wait, am I passing on bad habits to my students mm -hmm. that I'm not even aware of, yeah. things that are in my blind spot. And so I'm trying not to get too paranoid about, um, cause if I, if I focus on that too much, then I'll stop teaching again, mm -hmm. you know? But, and I want, I have a responsibility to all of my students, my current students, my future students to get all my personal stuff sorted out yeah. But then if I just wait until all of this is sorted and I'm being perfectionist about it, I won't ever have a full studio. I won't ever have this as a business. And I won't actually be able to help people where I'm at. Yeah. So I'm exploring that a lot right now and sort of seeing what are some precautionary boundaries that I can put up in the interest of my students while I'm still mm -hmm. learning more and more about this um, in such a way that doesn't hinder their progress by just being an absentee teacher. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's something anybody that, that teaches goes through at some point. Uh, hopefully, freaking hopefully. <laughs> um, yeah, no one should be perfect. <laughs> right, and and I think I mean for me, just because I've I've taught I've taught a couple of different things at at a couple of different levels. You know, I've worked with uh, right now. I have a seven year old guitar student. I'm, I've also taught a world class indoor drum line. Like I've I've kind of taught kind of everywhere in between, um, and I I think one of the things that made me effective at things that I was effective at as, a, as an educator was that I was always like, how can I relate this information better to these, this group of people? And the, you know, if I'm, you know, if I'm full-time teaching or if I have a private lesson studio, how can I make myself better for these students each week? And the students yeah. that I may get, how can I improve it for those people? So, um, I'm glad to hear that, you know, you're, you're outwardly thinking of that because um, yeah, I think, Probably most people do at some point, but that's that's something I think that's really really easy to lose focus on. And yeah. I mean, as professional musicians, we have to sometimes think, "Oh, this is making me money. I can eat this week, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to maintain my, the lights will stay on. Right. If I just teach a few more lessons. Yeah, one more pack out of ramen, right? It's a, exactly <laughs> right, and it's it's one of those things where you you sort of maintain the status quo, but. Um, uh, and I, I think the the education, the music education thing, you know, preparing yourself as a teacher and uh, how it relates to money and then how that necessity for you as the professional educator relates to you as the practical educator. Are you actually passing on information or are you passing the time so that your students won't quit? <laughs> there's there's a difference there. And I mean, there's... Again, there's, a, there's sort of a practicality to it. Um, but I think that's a really, really uh, fascinating topic that people... I mean, a lot of people, I think, teach in some capacity, especially if you're in the music world. Um, so, I mean, what's... 
I don't know. Would Brandon like what's your what's your teaching experience? I know you've done some like marching band teching, right? Yeah, uh, man, I. It's funny because you know I actually taught violin private lessons my first year uh, of college, and I was mm. woefully underprepared, and I. <laughs> nowhere near the status of uh, Valerie here because like I, I taught in this I was a contractor for a uh, a, a private studio um, in Fort Worth <clears throat> and I had uh, two two or three students um, one was like 56 year old and the other one was like eight and you know I, I didn't exactly know how to navigate all these you know different nuances of you know, people I didn't know how to you know, teach. You know, I hadn't taken like an education courses on how to teach, or you know, I didn't necessarily know what was practically best for these people who had these particular traits. Because you know, for me, I was, <clears throat> although I was classically trained, I was also very much a person who learned by rote. In addition to like you know, gaining a skill set in sight reading, um, and I just felt like I kind of you know, dropped the ball on it. Um, you know, that experience you know went by the wayside, and I ended. Uh, auditioning to become a drum major in a drum corps, and um, I ended up teching at my the old high school, my alma mater, Roman Catholic High School in Fort Worth, and I learned to uh, gain all the uh, technical precision that I learned in drum corps uh, from watching you know, drum lines rehearse and with the, with the rigidity and like the discipline to become better with like exact. Uh, muscle movements and precision with musicality um, and so I took that and I applied that to you know pretty much everything I did in terms of like uh, rhythm and pitch um, you know I, and then I went to a junior college and I applied the same thing there and I, I and I expanded on my like uh, teaching ability by teaching you know like what 40, 40 individuals who never had anything beyond like a 1A 2A mm -hmm. uh, music education mm -hmm. um and so, you know, I was like, I started getting more standards and more standards, and I auditioned at Sam, and I, I listened to the window ensemble, and I was like, oh my god, I want to be around, like, people that play at this level. Um, and then, you know, I, as I, as I started, like, teching at these different places, and I started going to Sam, I started developing, like, this, these opinions about, you know, what the ideal uh, for music should be. And, you know... Studying with my with my teachers and the professors that were there, um, Dr. Evangelina Cologne, Emily House Heilman, um, it's been a, a really amazing uh, opportunity to just develop an opinion of what what quality music is and, and being able to break break down the process to reach that. Um, it's you know most of my work has been with. Uh, as of recently in terms of like education has usually been as a technician for uh, marching bands right now I'm a, I'm a uh, contracted uh, staff member for the Willis High School marching band um, I've been there since 2016 and I've, I've been part of the team that has brought them to uh, going to state uh, contest for the first time yeah. um, in addition you know well, this isn't related to me but you know the program there is fantastic and like it's, it's been amazing to watch uh, the folks that are over there uh, Chris Allen and uh, Andrew Hicks, they do an amazing job with the program at Willis. They have a brand new uh, fine arts center because like, you know, the administration there just recognizes the quality of music education that's happening there. But anyhow, um, I, I've been part of that team to help them like grow and like everything is just like every day it's a matter of going to work and you know being really, really detailed and meticulous you know, with, these, with these kids. Um, and you know, trying to encourage them to like have higher standards and like doing everything you can to encourage like the, the smallest changes to help them become the best um, musician and best marcher that they could possibly be. Um, and trying to encourage that type of work ethic and, and that uh, practice and you know the thought process uh, behind that is like really really important towards creating a, a quality education. Um, encouraging kids to learn on their own, to come up with their own opinions and their own um, methods. They don't have to be the same as mine. My experiences will always be different than these kids. And there's been plenty of other technicians at this school that, you know, have different approaches and that I think are, that are just as valid in their own way, uh, shape, and form. Um, being 
allowing a, a kid or a child or a student to, mm. to recognize the validity <clears throat> of these different techniques and be able to like know that, oh yes, this is definitely something good and something I should take up on, is, is really important for me as an educator uh, to be able to allow someone to notice uh, the, the things that are good, allow them to pick up on a, a process that allows them to allows them to self-improve is at the end of the day like really important as an educator I, I mean that because your since your experience brand is, is pretty similar to mine because um, we had sort of the marching band thing and then we had a little bit of the drum corps slash indoor drum line thing and that's that's kind of its own thing that because a lot of what we talk about um, as educators is specifically um, within a school or a formal, I guess, air quotes, mm -hmm. educational setting. But a lot of learning takes place um, sort of outside of that or maybe parallel to that is more apt. Mm -hmm. um, but I, th I think it's interesting that you have, you have a very kind of similar uh, set of experiences to mine. Uh, but what I, what another thing that really fascinates me is um, having, you know, basically I'm almost finished with, with graduate school. My classwork is done. Um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to think about the next step. But as I do that, I'm thinking, I'm looking back and like, when I was an undergrad, when I was 20 years old, um, well, 21 as in 22 as a music major. Back in the day. Yeah, back in the day <laughs> when I shake my cane. Um, I, I think about, you know, who was I looking up to? Was I looking up to my professors? Was I looking up to somebody who taught me when I was in marching band or when I was studying private voice? Do I look, did I look up to those people as pedagogues or just simply because I was in the class? Or, um, you know, that's something uh, since, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more familiar with, with kind of Brandon's side of things. So I look up to the people that I taught with and the people who were my directors when I was a tech. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious, Valerie, about your experience because you've, you've thought about being a, a pedagogue and thinking about the technique behind teaching people. Did you have someone you looked up to that kind of guided you in a certain way or somebody you didn't want to be? Or what, what was your experience like in becoming the educator that you want to be or are working to be? Right, so as as I'm listening to you guys and as I'm sort of like mulling over um, mulling over <laughs> the answer to your question, I, I have a question that sort of is lingering in the back of my head is how different is the is the culture between like like the educational culture in terms of like band and drumline and things like that versus mm -hmm. like violin lessons. Mm -hmm. It's a yeah. very, very different thing because yeah. I feel like the violin in media in general is so put up on a pedestal, yeah. and a lot of it is like if you're not a if you're not a concert soloist, then what even are you? You know, and yeah. oh, you're in second violins. Oh, shame on you. Oh, you know, <laughs> yeah. well go to viola, right? <laughs> right? No, no, not the viola. Yeah. Not even violin lessons, but just string lessons in general. It's a different culture, and um, and I guess so. My, it's really. My experience with pedagogy really starts with my dad, actually, because um, at one point, I believe, I believe we were like living overseas, and yeah, we were living in Malaysia, we were living in Kuala Lumpur, and we saw a we saw an orchestra. Um, I don't remember which orchestra it was. It might have even been like the Kuala Lumpur Symphony or something. And I really looked up to my dad, and I wanted to. I mean, I just you know, as a kid, we looked up to her dad. And he was just, he so loved the violin and he so loved classical music. And he looked at the, he looked at the TV and he said like, wow, like being a musician and being an artist and having that level of dedication to something so beautiful is one of the noblest things I can think of. Mm. And that really, really stuck in me. And, um, and... I became, like, we had, like, a basic music class. This was around the time that I was in a third grade choir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, back in the day. Indeed. Yeah, so I was I was maybe, like, eight years old, I think. The star millennials. <laughs> Eight or not. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, so I remember we had tried violin lessons for a little bit, but 
it was something about the teacher that I had at the time, like, he could just not motivate me to practice. It was just, he was not getting through to me, even though this was something that I wanted to do. And so having someone just sit there and tell me to do exercises did not work. I was mm. not motivated. I was so not interested. <laughs> I, would, I would rather be doing anything other than playing the violin. And um, <laughs> just absolutely <laughs> anything on the planet. And um, But then, so a few years go by, we leave Malaysia and we actually move to the Yucatan. And my dad, he actually had been partly self-taught as a fiddler when he was 10 or 11. Mm. And um, he in part learned from his uncle, who learned from his grandfather, who learned from his grandfather, who learned from his grandfather, all of this fiddle music. So it's, it's been in our family for a long time. And eventually he learned from this, um, this very, very funny, very entertaining alcoholic in his hometown. A, more about fiddling, how to be um, like sort of a honky tonk bluegrass country fiddler, <laughs> and how to sing and how to play the guitar, and so he had a lot of experience with that. Um, even like doing professional stuff at bar, local bars, and things like that. Um, and then um, later on in his life, whenever he was in his forties, and whenever he could afford it, he actually started taking lessons like once a month from a. Um, with a violinist from the Shreveport Symphony, um, Shreveport, Louisiana, oh, and um, huh? I know that town. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I hear there's a Shreveport, Canada, from what I gather. There's a few no Shreveports, <laughs> so I, I feel yeah. like yeah. Louisiana and Canada are much more similar than you would think in some really? ways. Really? Yeah. I'll say that for another podcast. Yeah, that I, would be I another episode. More about for that. Sure. <laughs> I feel like any Louisiana listener to this podcast might just like. They're confused already, and they're just... <laughs> oh, <laughs> hey, yeah. hey, I don't, I don't describe to these viewpoints. Hey. I'm defending myself as, like, a native Texan. I know nothing. Whatever, man. I've heard excellent things about the people. Anyway, <laughs> whatever, whatever. I haven't actually been, but whatever. Um, and so he had, like, some experience learning by rote. Um, he actually, I think he got, like technically through Suzuki Book 5 in violin, which for not being able to read sheet music is like That's pretty right. impressive. That's about okay. as far as I got whenever I right? was He still Suzuki. can't read sheet music, but he got pretty far. And I do remember um, there was just this afternoon where he was actually, he was playing something. I don't even remember what it was. No, and I do know what it was. It was something by Baccarini. And uh, it was either like Baccarini or Mozart. But he was like, he was playing on the violin. He was like waltzing around the living room, and finally, like as though I had never had a violin lesson before, I was like, "Oh, can I do that?" He said, "Yeah, sure." And then, rather than going to get my own violin, what seemed to work best for us was that he would play a little bit, hand me his full size violin, even though I was like three feet tall, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then, like us just passing that back and forth for some reason, that worked best. Hmm. And um, and then gradually, we uh, eventually moved to Texas. I got plugged. I went to Knox Junior High. And I got signed into the beginner orchestra class, and I had such a supportive teacher who was really passionate about making sure that I had really strong violin teachers, uh, really strong private lesson teachers, and then, um, and then from there it was just I had I had the most eclectic and interesting collection of violin teachers, and it would be a whole other podcast to just to just talk about that. But um, I, in general, I think I've had, well, I've, I've just had, I've had many private lesson teachers, some of them for several years, some of them for just a brief period of time. And what I found consistently among all of them is that they, you're never just teaching your skills. You're never just teaching how to shift. You're never just teaching how to tune. You're teaching how to be a good musician. You're teaching how to be responsible. You're teaching how to be a good listener, how to have compassion, how to think abstractly about what a composer might have wanted hundreds of years ago who you will never meet and never fully understand. Well, we have time travel though, right? E. <laughs> Sorry. Hold on a Mac. You're, you're the time machine. Hey Siri, yeah. can you send me back to the past? No, don't get her up. Don't wake her up. No. I can't nope. control that setting key. Sorry oh. about that. I was All expecting you my iPad to say, here. not yours. <laughs> my Siri just ignores me whenever I talk, and then yours responds. I'm, I'm offended. All your fault, man. <laughs> it's Siri's fault. <sighs> but anyway, you're never just teaching the nuts and bolts of music. You're never just teaching 
basic violin maintenance. You're teaching how to be a good professional. You're teaching how to really show up every day, not just like physically be in a space, but how to be there presently and how to stay focused and how to create goals and how to stay motivated and how to whenever it's like someone lets you down or disappoints you, how what's the best way to respond to that when a student comes in that they haven't practiced enough that week? You know? <laughs> right? I'm not right? pointing at myself, I swear. <laughs> But you're never just teaching the violin. And so there's a lot of responsibility that comes with being a pedagogue. And whenever I had basically like called off private lesson teaching for, for a good while, um, a few years ago, at that time in total, while I was a full-time student, I, was, I think I was taking like 20 hours or something stupid. Um, no, I had 40 <laughs> students. I had 40 students while I was taking oh, no. 20 hours. <laughs> How did you do that? I remember, I remember you telling me about this actually while you were going through it. Yes. And I just did not believe that it was possible. It was to do absurd. That. Okay, so 13 of them were in a youth orchestra. And it wasn't even like a. It wasn't. It was a part of a youth orchestra that was like beginner violin class. Um, and so they just put a bunch of kids in there. It had been like three or four groups, but then there weren't enough teachers. So they just all, they put this vast amount of age ranges into my class. So I got to deal with, um, I think it was like seven years old to 12 years old, mm -hmm. which that yeah. is huge. Yeah. Is it, it was at least that much of an age range. A lot of development happens. And I was also teaching for, um, for a private studio and they were... And it was like, I was out of town and it paid a little bit better, but they would also sign me up to do group classes, one of which I seriously, I had like a six-year-old and a 12-year-old. And then two more students, three of the four were siblings. And it's just, oh, why? Probably. Why? Why? And then I wasn't allowed to pick out my own curriculum. I wasn't allowed to um, really just like sit down and take the time to do it a certain way. And then I would try to talk to these to the people who are running both organizations and they'd say, but you have so much to offer. Please just keep teaching. Oh, it's the right thing. You're getting so much experience. This is so good for you. You're learning so much problem solving. And problem solving. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I'm problem That's... identifying. Yes, but you're not letting me solve that. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I don't know about that and it was just, I've, I felt very, very frustrated. And then the more lessons, like aside from the studio and the youth orchestra, I did teach a few of my own lessons. And then as time went on, I just felt like I'm not bringing my best to yeah. each of these students and I'm not being a good example by letting myself be walked over this way. Yeah. And at one point, now I don't know, I don't remember exactly the name of this method, but for teaching the littlest children um, in one of these organizations, I had to teach out of a specific book. Now, I'm not saying this method could never work, but I am saying that you need to go to a, you should probably go through a special kind of training in order to teach this method. But basically, this book was suggesting that I teach children how to read staff, how to read sheet music without a staff. No staff whatsoever. And I'm like, it can be done, but it's just like, I am not trained for that. But I was required to use this book, and sure enough, like months would go by where I'm trying to make the best out of a bad situation. And honestly, like, I I still regret doing it. I should have just left because those kids, like, no matter how much they practice in a group session with that mm -hmm. kind of class, with that kind of age range, there's no way. Yeah. There's no way. Unless you have one particularly gifted one who's especially, who's mm -hmm. just prodigious. Like, there's just no way that that wasn't a waste of time and money. And, you know, and so at that point, I had enough instances like that going on at the same time. Also, I was just so incredibly busy that the only time I could schedule trio rehearsals was like two in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> Call it. All right. Yeah. Uh, undergrad. <laughs> yeah, but here's, here's, the, here's the really sad part. <laughs> like, even our coach could always schedule two in the morning. <laughs> he would go. And so he would schedule these for two in the morning and be there. It was crazy. Just as an edit, like, this is, this, is, this is the college party we're talking about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's currently 102, and we are doing podcasts. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? We're practicing. Yeah, it's... it's We're practicing I, for when we do a real podcast, what? Oh. 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 Oh.
<laughs> oh yeah, you get a you get a, a raise, and it's gonna be a percentage. Jack. <laughs> uh, Jack. No, I mean I, I think tease. I there's. Tease. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. That's something I'll say. <laughs> uh, I mean, I those those like teaching anecdotes. I think that's one of those. There's a lot of things that we talk about that could be their own episode. Um, but I, I think it's interesting. Um, I think that as a teacher, you should want to talk about teaching and your experiences because those are. I've had very very similar experiences, um, kind of all over the country. I mean, I've taught in Oklahoma and Maryland and. Um, uh, Virginia, I've taught in Texas, of course, but like, it's, yeah, I know, and I make all of the same. I made nothing. Kind of, we're doing some gestures over here, and you can I just use your imagination. I can neither confirm nor deny <laughs> gestures of any shape towards anyone. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's important to talk about um, teaching. If you if you're doing it because it can be it can be pretty stressful and those particular anecdotes about poor situations um, I don't know I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole just because uh, I don't know it's easy it's easy to get really cynical and bitter and uh, want to quit teaching and you know I, I'm I'm personally taking some some time off of you know teaching full time but um, still I still like. You know, sharing information with with young people and and older people too. I mean, I've I've had some adult students that have been wonderful to work with. But um, I, I think it's it's always good to know, like, if you're going to be doing something, if you're teaching, or if you're starting a nonprofit, or if you're going to be conducting a choir, I think it's good to have people to look up to. Um, and if you are actually Kermit the Frog, uh, you're good in all of those regards. Yay! One, two, three, three. <laughs> Right? That's I, what Brandon's going to do I'm at the next so lesson. I just wanted to say, like I somewhat warned you of last night, the later it gets, the less of a filter. <laughs> That's okay. That is okay. Join That's, us for this, this is a podcast. Real podcast. <laughs> the Frog. This is a real podcast with Kermit the Frog and everything. <laughs> Is that copyright? Because like, I'm not sure if we could say that. Man, if this is actually Kermit the Frog, I can actually only say about 35 words. (laughs) Oh God! (laughs) Don't y'all worry about it, okay? Don't y'all worry about that. (laughs) This isn't my podcast, so I'm not gonna get sued. You uh, should be concerned because this is a very real podcast. Yes. Oh, but you know, but <laughs> I'm not now. Who hosts the podcast? Now it's a real podcast. I mean, does anybody host it? Is it even real? Does it exist? <laughs> or is this just a farce? Okay. Is it a, is it a farce? Um. <laughs> I'm making the Home Alone face. The Home Alone face. What Colin Culkin used. Okay. We try to forget about him, but you know. It's... Uh. Well, I think since so since I think. Maybe we one way to kind of start tying it up because um, we talked about you know some nonprofit stuff. We talked about a little bit about teaching and, and learning too, which is really cool. Um, offered some interesting perspective. Uh, I'm curious, what are y'all just what are y'all working on? What piece are you working on? Are you writing uh, or learning how to play or sing or conduct? Like what's what's on your plate right now? Whoever wants to like, fight really hard for it to go first, you can go first. Okay, I, I, I'll take the. What are you working on? Um, you know, I'm currently working on this uh, uh, in composition. I, I, I've I've got this weird aversion towards writing for piano, and for some reason, uh, you know, I, I constantly work with, with my collaborative pianist, and you know, as a as young violinist when I was taking violin for like ten years or so, I constantly used to like. In the and piano, or the uh, idiosyncrasies of piano, and I guess you know having to compose for it, I just feel really, really awkward having to do it in this you know modern day and age where you know people are rather progressive with the way that people approach piano. Um, they do everything from like extra you know extended techniques like you know plucking the piano strings or mm-hmm. like throwing something in the piano and then playing the piano and you know all different types of sound manipulation and you know I'm just trying to like figure out do I use a chord here or do I use like an open fifth mm-hmm. or do I use one note at a time or it's it's for me I, I, I get the the opportunities to write for this instrument are, are infinite you know there's so many options you can have with 88 keys mm-hmm. and you know you have that same I have that same issue with orchestration as well right for large works or writing for anything larger than, like, say, you know, a double chorus 
you know, eight, eight voices more or less. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, having listened to the uh, uh, the the Sam Houston uh, Contemporary Music Festival with the uh, guest composer Adam Schoenberg, uh, being able to watch his process and then uh, going through the uh, New American Voices thing, and watching someone literally just imitate styles and put serious vocal lines through it has been very, very uh, validating to my own compositional style. Because, you know, like I said earlier in the podcast, you know, I'm dealing with this concept of uh, imposter syndrome, like, you know, mm -hmm. I, 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 I can't possibly be worthy of writing sure. blah, blah, blah. And, it really is the thing that plagues a lot of musicians, and you know, and I, I don't know whether y'all two have it, but for me, it's like you know, yep, yep, I, just, yep, yep. I just don't feel like it's possible that like I could be a valid composer in any way. And um, but you know, watching other composers who have a similar thought process to my own and and make a living at doing it, it's like oh well, you know, I don't necessarily need to make a living at doing that, but I can please either myself or I can please you know an audience potentially by uh, interpreting it in this way or uh, approaching it in this way, writing mm -hmm. in this way. Um, so right now, for in composition, that's like a, a big thing that I'm working on, trying to like come to this acceptance that like my music can have validity, you know, as long as I don't write it like poorly. If I put, you know, the proper time and effort, it, sure, it, will, be, it, it will be a product that, you know, people might be interested in listening to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and likewise with, you know, my private lessons in voice uh, with Dr. Emily House Heilman, um, you know, I, I deal with the same problem of imposter syndrome. Like, you know, um, prior to being a vocalist, I was a violin player for you know, a very long period of time, and it was a very, very strong pas passion of mine. I dropped out, you know, started going into the marching band route, and then I realized I didn't want to do that either. And um, but with that said, you know, violin was like a very, very important part of my life, and you know, I dropped it. I went to voice pretty suddenly um, that said in my, in my voice lessons it's all about uh, all about trying to uh, create that evenness and uh, fluidity of sound um, you know, they, they talk about this belt canto style of you know beautiful singing uh, and you know I'm very much a chorister type mm -hmm. um, you know following these really really extreme types of dynamic contrasts and um, and, and blending with your fellow person because you know I, I, I'm more an ensemble person like yeah. John is yeah. um, and I appreciate the uh, solo idiom because I think there's a there's a beauty and um, there's, there's just an intense beauty to solo playing solo singing um, it's different than uh, than ensemble works and there's validity and and beauty in, in that type of music but I'm just I feel like I need to belong uh, to something. It doesn't matter whether it's part of a, a musical ensemble or an organization with ideas or ideals. Um, it's, it's, it's really important that I be a part of something bigger than myself. Um, so, yeah. So I guess we'll hang for that. Is it my turn now? If you want it to be your turn, there's uh, no... Uh, there's like no, it's, it's like it's my there's turn. no set rules. <laughs> so, well, I... Um, I was going to say, like, well, I am not directing a choir. <laughs> That's brand new. Oh, doing well, that. I didn't I'm even not... talk about that. I completely forgot <laughs> about that. The night is young. The night is young. It's, <laughs> young. it's tomorrow now. We, you're, you're all day. It's fine. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> Don't remind me, we got that 10.30, uh, 10.30. I'm, oh, yeah, I'm not composing right. anything. But in terms of just things I'm working on, um, I'm working on... In a sense, like sort of rehabbing my own uh, personal technique just so that I can have something that's sustainable that's not going to um, exacerbate some medical conditions that I have. Um, and also, I'm trying to like determine what's going to be a healthy balance between um, the romantic repertoire that I want to dig into more and a lot of modern pieces that I absolutely adore mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then balancing that out with uh, historically informed performance because unlike choristers who can um, you can, could really do either in the same day I, it requires a little bit of an equipment change for me mm -hmm. yeah, I'd have to switch from gut strings to metal strings and, um, and so 
it's just changing you know. my throat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ugh, gross. Just, just really gross. No, no, no. That's why I hate you guys. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I'm trying to find a healthy balance between um, modern playing styles and older playing styles. And so there's that issue. Then another issue of should I be focusing more on unaccompanied repertoire because I, you know, in terms of performing it, it's just much less of a hassle once I like get more of an audience mm-hmm. and like start like doing on doing more of my recitals and stuff like that. It's much more affordable to just do unaccompanied sure. stuff. Yeah. And it's much simpler and that's the Lone Ranger in me talking. Um, for sure. And then on the other hand, I so there's of course in violin music there's so much accompanied stuff that's just absolutely beautiful and it's important to just like stay up on. Like I wasn't expecting um, last fall, I was playing with the Conroe Symphony, and they had David Kim, concert master of the Philadelphia Orchestra, come in as their well, soloist. What? Yes. <laughs> right on. I told you about this. <laughs> That's right on. They, he did the Brook Concerto, and he did Schindler's List, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so Dude. then, of course, he only was there for, like, the dress rehearsal and the soundtrack of the concert. That was it. But up until then... Um, the conductor like had me stand up and sight read Schindler's List in front of the orchestra, and I was so I was thrilled. I loved it, and so they let, just let me um, have that experience, which for me, I mean, that was just an absolute treat. Yeah. Um, and so, in a sense, I you can't just you just can't schedule those kinds of opportunities all the time. They just happen. So I want to have more big pieces like the Brook Concerto, the Brahms Concerto, I need to polish up my Lalo, you know, things like that. I want to have, um, I mean, like, everyone loves polishing their Lalo a little bit too much, but um, if you know what Lalo Violin Concerto is, then you, you know what I mean. But, um, but trying to find a good balance between accompanied and unaccompanied works. And then on top of that, um, I've recently formed a duet. We don't have a cool sounding duo name yet. But <laughs> Work in progress. Yeah, that's our name, yes. Work in progress is our <laughs> oh, name. <laughs> just so far over the plate, just we'll think of something. <laughs> Let the good idea happen. <laughs> a work in progress. <laughs> I guess we're renaming the choir until you actually copyright that. Yeah, we already have the website. It's fine. Oh, you're right. Oh, all right. It took me, you know how long it took me to make that logo for crying out loud? Ugh. And then how much longer it took to get the thing on the website? That's oh, fair. That's that fair. was. Oh, yeah. I'm just much rather than like driving so many to pick up someone from the airport was worse than that. But no, I think, <laughs> definitely think that y'all's is. Well, you haven't there. had to. Well, well, you've seen me struggle with Squarespace and Photoshop now, yeah. Illustrator. And my laptop. <laughs> you mean your laptop battery? My, well, yes, my laptop battery. No, it's fine. Oh, so. <laughs> do you have any extra tea I could have? Well, you yeah, don't think you don't have to spill the tea on my laptop, man. I got, I got some tea. I would and whatever, my, some, I would love some tea. Okay. Some tea. Well, uh, I mean, you were talking and, about your the rep that you were preparing. Right. I'm gonna go make oh, yeah. some tea. I'll just wrap that up here. <laughs> Um, but yeah, just sort of exploring um, what it's like to have a duet. I've never had a. Are you are you guys set with your drink? Do you yeah, lemon ginger. Good? Okay, good. I don't want to interrupt you too. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> what was that? Nothing? Okay, fine. Anyway. I, you don't have to add salt to my tea, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, as much as I say that I like doing long range stuff, I absolutely adore chamber music and have, at one point, I even founded a string quartet, uh, which I think, it was really, it was such a great learning experience. But then, on the other hand, like, it's a, the perfectionist in me always wants to like kind of like wait and hold out um, for for like just the right perfect combination of people to get something done. And the realist in me is just saying like, well, your dream quartet is probably going to take a while, so let's just enjoy a duet in the meantime. So it's so nice to have a at least one chamber music partner to work with. Her name is Katie Asani, and she is wonderful. Um, and beyond that, I do coach at the Woodlands Chamber Music Festival every year. I've been uh, part of the chamber music, uh, part of Chamber Fest for the last five or six years, I believe. Whenever they started going to the pavilion, that was my first year. 
and um, and it's such a privilege every year to get to be in it. Um, aside from myself and the other faculty member, Zachary Montasser, um, I think, I believe, like everybody else on the faculty is from Juilliard and and we touched on this a little bit earlier, how sometimes there's this sense of eliteness in classical music and how it's not accessible. And so um, you would think that, and at least for me, like I always, it takes me like at least a few hours to not get intimidated by everyone else because they're so qualified and they're so skilled and they're so talented. But it's such a breath of fresh air to get to work with them in a chamber music setting, not just as chamber musicians amongst ourselves, but teaching the next generation about chamber music. These are like, I, I really genuinely feel like the best artists that I've met are the most humble people. And they're the sweetest and most considerate people. And um, and they just don't look down on you at all whatsoever for having less experience or, or for just being in a different situation at all. They meet you right where you're at. And honestly, isn't that what music is supposed to do? Isn't that what we want our music to do as performers? We want our music to meet people where they're at right now, okay. not necessarily to have them jump through all of these overly intellectual hoops to get to our emotional whatever we wanted to pull out of them. We want to meet them right where they're at. And, um, and that's, I mean, that's what's a beautiful thing about chamber music. So in a sense, I, like, I call myself like a lone ranger, but I am so happy to be in these collaborative projects with my duet partner within the, the Woodlands Chamber Fest. I can, I can talk today. Within the Woodlands Chamber Fest. <laughs> and uh, within the Avanzari Vocal Ensemble. And it's just, it's been a real treat to get to do that kind of, to do that kind of thing and not feel, and just like, each decision doesn't weigh so heavily on me because I have a team of people to like at least mull it over with, even if we don't have an answer right away. And so that I think has been probably the most rewarding bit of my work lately, just having a team. Yeah, I, as, as a person who's like used to being a Lone Ranger, like, you know, I, I, I I'm not gonna lie. I do find it fascinating. I do find that there is like a cultural divide between like string players. Um, and I said as a former string player who was like the definition of a lone wolf <laughs> until I actually got into uh, marching band. Marching band was actually the thing that like brought me out of my shell and realized, oh, ensemble music is like or large ensemble music is something that I really wanted to do uh, because you know, I, you know, as a uh, as a young child, I grew up uh, learning the Suzuki method um, with a fantastic uh, music educator at uh, TCU. He ran, he, he's, if I'm not mistaken, he's still in charge of their uh, music preparatory program. Um, uh, going through the Suzuki method, you know, I went through book five and then I learned some other pieces that were outside of those uh, books. I absolutely relate to the idea that you know, I, as a string player, it was definitely a one ranger. I remember, like, I felt the entire... I felt so much guilt after me messing up the uh, Bach violin concerto in A minor. I, you know, and I just felt like was, like, my world had ended because I messed it up and it was side. It was like, what, 11 or 12? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's so easy to, you know, as, as, as that type of, you know, as that stereotypical lone ranger, like, take that all that that frustration out on yourself as a musician um, but you know coming into this collaborative process with other musicians and, and, and another team members such as like Valerie and John in my case it becomes so much easier to say hey well you know I've got some frustrations and I feel like you know I can be helped out you know if, if you know if you can help me with this I can do this other thing and then you know not only do I have an opportunity to do something separately they have an opportunity to like cut, make uh, to bring into fruition something that you know they think could be a, a valid idea, or that they think that could be a great idea, um, it allows me to like step back and like watch someone you know be able to experiment and have progress over this you know, over a different concept that you know through my experiences I may never have come up with. You know, you know just to like bring it up to like literal examples, you know, I, I have no idea what to look for on a website. I mean, you know, John, uh, John and Valerie both have both made websites for, you know, Valerie for her uh, Pregnancy Studios and for her web, for art, artist page, 
and John with his with his own artist page. Artist page. It's you know for me I'm just like eh, I just, I, I'm, I've got some stuff and I'll, I'll make a Facebook page and uh, that's about it and I have no idea what 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 design that they they spend hours and hours upon researching and figuring out what work what works well. Honestly, we're just happy you make a MySpace page. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, what's MySpace again? Like, like, granted, uh, I think I would have been stuck in like video game music and Sega. anime. I'm going to pretend you did not say that, but... You have one. <laughs> uh, sure. Wait, pause. I'm guilty. I made a Zanga. <laughs> I made a Zanga. I, I'm going to pretend all of you didn't hear that. But, uh, well, edit it on post, right, John? Yeah, please edit it on post. It's worse than cursing, to be honest. Um, you don't know how podcasts work. I know I didn't. There's no explicit label on this, right? No, we, uh, we haven't cursed yet, so... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but back to Zang, my friend. Um, but anyhow, uh, back to uh, being able to rely on a team. Uh, without without this board and I, this project would be impossible. Uh, without their valuable skill set, their their knowledge, their their passion for the love and, and love of music, uh, it, you know, this project would just be unavailable, unavailable to our to our community. Um, and at the end of the day, it really is for you know, the community. And, you know, it's really circular, of course, but you know, having having their decades of experience in music, having their decades of experience in in, in, in problem solving. And John had talked about this, this con- uh, sorry, it, was, it wasn't just John. It was John and Valerie talking about this concept of problem solving through lessons and whatnot, or finding out that you're being told you're problem solving. Uh, and then realizing that the problem was like people telling you that you're problem solving. Yeah. You know, things, things of the sort, this really, really like in depth, uh, in the mind idea of collaboration is super helpful to making, you know, ideas and visions become a reality. I'll add, I'll add one thing to that. Um, I, it was sometime last week whenever Andre and I were on our little Conroe Symphony rehearsal. We were talking about how bad it makes us feel whenever we make a mistake. I, I thought it was whenever you were saying about how, as whenever you're a soloist especially, you make one mistake, it just hits you so much harder <laughs> when you're doing it by yourself. I feel like a big part of like a cultural thing between like string, string playing, string lessons, and every other kind of lesson is that there's just more solo rep written for us. And it's just, I don't know, it's more... Yeah, there's just more solo rep. But anyway, she and I were talking about how... Um, because if a really great performance, it's going to, honestly, the music itself is going to come alive and it's going to feel like a living, breathing thing, right? But then whenever you miss a note, it feels like you hit a squirrel a little bit. And then if you like, if you make a bigger mistake, it feels like you maybe hit a dog or whatever. And then you really screw up like, oh, I hit a deer. You you know, that's that's kind of what it feels like whenever you make a big mistake in music. And you're just like, oh no, it's me. Like, oh, what have I done? (laughs) I'm not trying to mansplain this, but like, (laughs) but deer stare at your car because you got the headlights on. I'm just saying, because like my friends hit a deer once. That's not the only way for deer to get hit by a car. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I had a deer hit itself <laughs> with my car once. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I had my sister once. But car like red Kermit the Frog. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. That happens to all of my cars. <laughs> How many deer have you hit? Look. Why well, you now you're knocking on wood? <laughs> I hit one deer and it Kermited my I had a white Ultima and then had when I was when I was a high school teacher, one of my students backed over my car with his truck. Bad. Just nice. ran it over. Just ran it over real bad. And I have photos of that one. Yeah, it it was Kermit. That's something I would like to <laughs> over. Like that's something I would like to <laughs> shot over. Yeah, it's fine. It's Quote fine. unquote. I mean, anyway, I being <laughs> being a soloist. <laughs> Uh, well, all I was gonna say, I'm sorry. <laughs> more animals. Well, we more animals with our. With well, our I mean, animals. we can add birds, but. <laughs> no, no, we can't. All right, birds. so all I was gonna say is that, in a sense, 
in a sense, like doing this collaborative work, it almost feels like we're all taking care of like this new animal or this new creature. Mm -hmm. In a sense, it's just like, well, who's going to walk the dog today? Did you feed him today? Did you water him today? That's what it yeah. feels like. It feels like there's a little bit of even a family that's growing around this thing that we're raising now. And yeah, but what you were going to say about solos? And well, I mean, I that's I think it's it's. It's impossible to create what an ensemble can create elsewhere. Like, if you're playing an unaccompanied solo, there's definitely, you're able to find some profound ideas and moments and express yourself in a really profound way. But, I mean, the, there is, not that I've, and I've, I've searched for it. I mean, I think everybody does a, a little bit to a certain extent. Um, there's not a way to replicate the feeling of being in an ensemble. Even if you're functioning as the soloist with an ensemble um, you are you are doing something that's impossible to do alone and I think I think if there's anything to take away from this entire episode um, that that just working with people in whatever capacity doesn't matter what you're doing working with people um, is just is different I think a lot of people probably like it better I know I personally do. Um, and a lot of people find a more it, it's a more gratifying experience um, if you do it. You know, even with just one other person, if you're making music and, and one other person is is making music with you, I think that's um, yeah. that's a really important distinction. Um, and yeah, you need to practice so like you can make the music you want to make. What's that? I, I mean. <laughs> Uh, I've read about it once. That's not. That's not true. I've never read anything. But it's, uh, you know, you, just, you you have to get to a certain point where you you know your stuff, but then to really to really do the thing, I, I think you kind of have to kind of have someone hang out with you a little bit, which especially for composers is not, you know, not our not our our main mo. Yeah, wrong with that. But um, so I I think uh, I think that may be a good place to wrap it up. I mean, we've we've uh, we've showed some stuff about the ensemble. I think it's definitely cool that that uh, we're able to do that. And I hope to get Benny and Allison maybe on one. See if they've got some time. Yeah, and maybe yeah. all of us together. I'm not gonna lie, Benny's on the Shire side, but like. Allison's got like such a wealth of knowledge. She could have like five podcasts of just the mm -hmm. infinite knowledge she has over and she's, business. She's and, so like, well spoken. Oh. Like, I've literally only met her in person like twice, but still, yeah. like she's, she's one like, of the most intelligent yeah. people I've ever met in my life. Well, if you hear this, Allison, and uh, we don't get to you first, the podcast us. Uh, please come to the podcast. I think it would be. I, I agree. I think it would be a really really interesting conversation. Um, I, I think because cause she does music, you know, I know she sings and, and was, was part of that music scene in college, but uh, that's another interesting perspective. Some people like eventually be, be, end up being things that are not professional musicians per se, but still are involved in the world. I definitely agree that that would be a very fascinating conversation. Yeah. Um, like, to be honest, that's like part of the reason I think these two individuals, because like Benny and Allison were people that weren't. They're not music majors. Mm -hmm. you know, Benny was, and Allison was, but you know, uh, Benny pers is, has a business degree and is a uh, you know, an analyst and uh, nerd. <laughs> and then you know, Allison, you know, she has a musicology degree, musicology degree, but she didn't apply that to anything in, uh, in terms of music. Mm -hmm. She ended up, you know, going. Uh, she went into case law for a little bit and then did something else, and now is project manager for Exxon Mobil, the largest oil company in the world. So, I mean, you know, I, yeah. So, that would be, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, but this, this is wonderful, and um, I hope, I hope any of y'all listening, check out the ensemble. Um, check out, you know, check out Valerie's website. Check out uh, things that Brandon's doing. Check out maybe, like, you know, the, uh, the local chapter find me office see what they're up to um, just because all, all these things like they these are things that mean a lot to us and it's, they're worth sharing um, you know and if you if you dig this podcast I definitely I'll, I love feedback um, if you want to be on it you know if you're if you're listening and you're up at Sam um, 
or I can, I've even done remote podcasts before. Uh, if you think you, uh, something that I'm doing is interesting or you think that I would be a, a, a fascinating person to talk to and record it and play it for people, then uh, I'd be more than happy to talk to you. I'm not, uh, I'm not a super exclusive person. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to get to talk with people that I'm, I'm working with currently, uh, but I, I definitely like talking music with people. I'll vouch for him. He's very fascinating to talk to. <laughs> Oh, that's that's super sweet, but it's it's fun. <laughs> uh, I do talk about birds kind of a lot, but um, I think it was a whole podcast without really talking about birds. So well, I'm surprised. I didn't actually know that. Was... Well, almost. Okay, one's at the end. It doesn't count. Yeah, it really doesn't count. There's a bird on my computer. There's birds all over my apartment. Well, we're making a bird joke about. She has a good way through. She said, you hit a bird. I'm scared. I don't want to hit a bird. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you all so much for, for being on. And, uh, again, check out the website for um, Avansari Vocal Ensemble. It's avansariv.org. I'm going to put that in the link for the uh, podcast episode. And any any closing remarks? Any, any you want to... A-V-A-N-Z-A. R E V E dot org. There it Just, is. Just you know, for we're using a print, Italian pronunciation. <laughs> it's not necessarily common to Texas. I'm born and raised in Texas, but you know, you take Italian diction one semester, and <laughs> you kind of just have to like do it, or else your teachers are gonna never let you forget. So you're telling me that we are not the Avanzari vocal ensemble. Who, yeah, who wants Avenzari? to the Texas Avenzari? 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 Avenzari. 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 <laughs> so you'll probably Avenzari. be able to figure it out from uh, any of these <laughs> wonderful renditions. <laughs> I'm so sorry to voice this that I've had in the past. I do sincerely apologize if you hear this. <laughs> yes, apologize on behalf of the violinist who's never taken the voice. Like, please do. I'm so sorry. I apologize for my ignorance and pronunciation. <laughs> Not like I'm the one who came up with the name. <laughs> God, I have to concede to that. <laughs> Take that the five dollars that I owe you for that. <laughs> All right, y'all. Well, thank y'all for so much for tuning in uh, for the Music in Our World podcast. This is uh, John Patty. Thanks again for listening, and I will catch you next time. Sweet. Oh no! <laughs> next time. Now next bit. time. <laughs>